Hello, and welcome to the uh, Managing Kubernetes Edge Fleets Prone to Network Fault Tolerance talk for the Open Network and Edge Summit. I am Mark Abrams. I'm a field engineer edge specialist with Rancher Labs. And um, what I do is I work with uh, pre and post sales teams as a technical resource for Rancher Labs and to help um, teams learn how to build things out on the edge using Kubernetes um, and to learn about how they're doing it prior to, to us getting involved and sort of help the, the rancher team develop the right product by interfacing with these other teams. Um, I have an agenda here for us today. And um, what I'd like to do, I, I wanna do things a little bit different today. Um, normally I save my demos for the end of a presentation, but because of the way we're presenting today, um, I wanna make sure I get the, the demo in. And um, so we'll demo first, you can always come back to it. If, you, if you're thinking about it throughout the presentation, of course it's pre-recorded, so you can roll back and take a look and see what I was doing. Um, and then after I present, um, we'll talk about it a little bit. After that, um, I wanna talk about some of the foundations um, for this presentation. Um, and then I'll talk about containers and container orchestration. Now, many of you already know about containers and container orchestration. Uh, some of you don't though, so I wanna really make sure I, I cover it for everybody and that I'm really addressing everybody who's interested in, in this information. Um, so I'll do it briefly. It's gonna be a summary. If you don't know about containers and container orchestration, this is not the only talk you should be watching. There's a lot more to it and you should go check it out. Um, of course, I'm gonna talk about network fault tolerance and um, sort of the what, is, what it is and, and give some examples of where we see it um, on the edge and in um, our customers and in, in uh, the people that I talk to day, to day in and day out. And then I'll talk about uh, K3S in practice and, and uh, lightweight Kubernetes and how it can be used with um, the edge and network fault tolerance. Um, the fleet is part of the title, um, fleet references large numbers, uh, many large numbers of Kubernetes clusters. Um, well, fleet references large man number, managing large numbers of anything in the, um, basically in the, in this presentation, I'm really talking about edge fleets of uh, Kubernetes clusters. So uh, let's get on with it. So let me move right along. We'll move on to the demo. And for that, I'm gonna go to, what I have as a pre-recorded terminal session. So um, if you look at, up at the top left here, you'll see I've, I've already loaded a command, watch kubectl get pods, and that's the first command I'm gonna run. I'm gonna go ahead and play this and I'll talk through it as it goes. So I run that command and there's nothing there. I get an error. It, it actually doesn't find any resources because there are none. So I move down to the bottom part of the terminal and I apply this uh, speed limit YAML, which is the configuration file for some resources that I wanna put into Kubernetes. Those resources include um, the fault tolerance namespace and a daemon set uh, with this speed limit application in it. And you can see now I'm up in the top right-hand side and I'm actually running, um, I, I try and look at the logs for this speed limit container that popped up on the top left, but nothing came up. There, there, was, there were no logs at first, and that's because there's an initialization container. That init container actually is holding back the, the main container from starting because it's checking to make sure that the network tolerance, the network speeds are acceptable. So it, it checks, it figures out, yep, the network speeds are good. My new container pops up and it starts downloading content. And I'm actually just looping through and pulling down cncf.io again and again and again until I go over to my network control and I actually start throttling the network uh, for this device. Um, so it's something I can do to demonstrate what it looks like when my bandwidth goes, goes sour, right? So bad bandwidth, rather than running, stopping the speed limit container, you can see I didn't, the container's still running, but actually I stopped downloading. So I, we're in another part of the, the um, app where it just stops pulling down the CNCF stuff. Then I go back and I throttle it back up and you'll see it starts downloading content again. 
So this is just one representation of what you can do um, using Kubernetes to manage network faults. Um, what I have here, and I'll just pause the video right here because this is a static information, but this is a view of what's actually deployed um, into this Kubernetes, this K3S cluster. Um, and you can see that the first thing here is an init container. And that init container is um, really just running speed test. This is something you've probably run in your browser before to try and test the, uh, the network latency of your own home network uh, or you're in a coffee shop or something. Going well, so you run speed test, right? Um, and that, that's run as a command line tool. Um, so I'm able to run that in a container, get the results and figure out what do I wanna do with my workload? Um, but the first one, the init container actually prevents the workload from starting. Um, but once it's started, I have this liveness check and I run that, I run the liveness check um, periodically. You can see it delays for 20 seconds and it timeouts for 30 seconds. It, it allows a timeout of 30 seconds, so it'll allow 30 seconds for it to run. Um, and it, then it'll do this every five seconds. Um, the, the liveness check is almost this, identical to the init container, but it's actually running um, as part of Kubernetes just part of the functionality that I get from container orchestration. So um, my, I'm managing my application, I'm managing how much it accesses the network um, using some Kubernetes facilities to do so. So cool, that's the demo. Let's talk about how I got there and um, what the significance of these, um, you know, the other parts of network fault tolerance, why use Kubernetes on the edge and how it can help us with problems like this. So here's some of the uh, uh, foundations to the presentation, some of the constraints that um, I saw when looking at network to fault tolerance with our customers and prospects um, and with the, you know, lots and lots of different edge scenarios. Um, it turns out one of the most common problems um, for edge devices is uh, network fault tolerance. Um, it, it's extremely common, low bandwidth, limited connectivity, spotty connectivity. Um, every time I have a conversation, not every time, but very often when, when we have conversations with um, customers who are working on the edge, um, those are issues that they have. Sometimes, you know, they, it's um, even like an air gap network. So they, they built a network that just doesn't allow any interaction with the outside at all. So it's not really a network fault, um, but often the edge is disconnected at long periods of time. Um, the other sort of common theme for um, the edge stack that I see is hundreds or tens of thousands of devices. Um, you know, just, just massive numbers of devices at the edge. Um, and that's what I call a fleet. Right, it's a, it's a large number of devices. Um, this obviously, I did this demo on a single device, so it applies to a single device. Um, but uh, we need to be able to handle this across many devices. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about fleet today. There wasn't really enough time for me to really talk about how to manage fleets. Um, but the idea of network fault tolerance in fleets is really um, common. So. Um, and there will be other talks. Um, I have some other upcoming talks that about fleet as well. So I, hopefully that'll get to a Linux Foundation event coming to you soon. Um, I also have um, seen non-homogeneous resources at the edge. I mean, this is pretty common. The data center, um, we just lay out these servers and the idea is that everything's got CPU and RAM and that's what our resource, that's what our applications need. At the edge, that's not the case. Um, at the edge, what we find is that um, there's more than just uh, CPU and RAM. Oftentimes, uh, well, in the, in the data center, sometimes it's GPUs. At the edge, it's GPUs, but it's also as well. Um, everything from, um, you know, actuators and sensors to devices, the, the hardware right on the device. For example, um, in one of my demos, um, which I won't show you today, but I, I actually control the NIC right from Kubernetes. So, um, you know, we, we may have other types of devices, Bluetooth, Zigbee, stuff like that. We'll talk about that later. So 
why container orchestration? Why, why should I use container orchestration at the edge? Um, I want systemic consistency across the enterprise. I want my development teams who are developing apps to have consistency even as we go out to the edge. Traditionally, the edge has been embedded systems and my app is tightly coupled with my operating system. And um, to update that package, I need to do a firmware upgrade. And so it's a very you know, onerous, um, problematic task. It doesn't happen often. The, whereas the life cycle for app updates, um, we're approaching, you know, we're, we're never gonna get to, to zero um, minutes, but we're approaching momentary updates in, in um, the data center, right? And, and not everybody's doing that today, but that, that was the goal. That's how we uh, developed distributed computing in part, you know, that was the, um, impetus behind it. So container orchestration brings me um, availability and scalability and a minimum, sometimes reliability. Uh, it allows me to separate my concerns at the edge so I can take that embedded system as my app built in, separate the hardware from the operating system, from the application, up it, update those independently, keep my app on a more consistent update lifecycle, it into an application lifecycle more similar to what we see in the cloud. Um, these are all things that we see our edge customers desiring to get and that they can achieve through Kubernetes and uh, container orchestration. Um, in addition, I get then the remote management, right? So now I can, I can update my, um, I actually through Kubernetes, I can even update my hardware as well. I can update um, my, my OS and my, my um, other parts of the hardware, depending on how it's operating, um, but it is possible to do even using Kubernetes uh, with things like a system upgrade control uh, controller. And then of course, I wanna manage tens to hundreds of thousands of devices. So um, a typical scenario on the edge, this is a typical network layout, like just really superficial, right? I've got device one through device N, and they just talk back to the data center or the cloud, uh, what have you. Um, and then there's these other scenarios where I have these devices, but I insert a gate a device map. Um, so my devices don't talk directly to the cloud. They talk through a gateway and then the gateway talks to the cloud. So pretty much in these two scenarios, um, they can get, these networks can get much more complex behind the data center or downstream from the data center. Um, but this is the general gist of it. And the, the issue is, the issue for network fault tolerance anyways, is when we lose connectivity at any one of these points. So if any of these things lose connectivity to their partner, that has an impact, um, but it shouldn't cause total failure of the system. And again, Kubernetes can help with that. So I'm gonna leave you with that as sort of the foundations for this, this talk. Um, we did the demo already. I'm gonna to touch on containers and container orchestration. I'm gonna zip over it. So for those of you that know it, please bear with me. For those of you that don't, um, this is very superficial, but I wanna just make sure you're with me for the rest of the talk. So for containers and container orchestration, um, on the right-hand side, what you see is sort of the traditional processes, right? You'll see that I've got my uh, device and then I've got my operating system. I've got some, um, process and my process has dependencies. On the left hand side, um, I've containerized those processes. So they're, they're um, sitting on top of this Docker runtime. You've, I'm sure you've heard of Docker. It's a container runtime and it just allows me to run these containers um, with their processes um, so that we can fully contain the process and its dependencies in most cases. Um, in the data center, resources are homogenous, so I can, I can pretty much fully contain them and just depend on that every machine's gonna have the resources I need, or um, I can use things like taints and tolerations in Kubernetes to target specific hardware. However, at the edge, I absolutely, the resources at the edge are homogenous, um, but they are finite and known for any given scenario which means at some point I must decide what hardware operating system, sensor, actuator, whatever it is that my edge device will have. And I can start targeting processes to the resources that are available there. So um, with that, let's look when we insert. So 
they just have containers, right? But what I want is container orchestration. Containers aren't enough. Um, they can contain my app, sort of, um, but some of the dependencies are in the hardware, right? They're not in the container themselves. Um, with container orchestration, I'm adding this other layer. You can see I have K3S here, uh, which is Kubernetes, and it has CRI. So that's the container runtime. K3S happens to use container D, not Docker, um, but it's got my pods with my container. So it looks very similar to what we had. It's just my container runtime is inside of, of the container orchestration um, application that's running. And this allows me to do things like networking, scheduling. Um, and when I talk about scheduling, I'm not talking about putting things on your calendar. I'm talking about scheduling resources. What, what workloads need what resources? Where are they? Kubernetes can help me with that. I can manage app and service life cycles. I can uh, get scalability and reliability of the services. And uh, if I have multiple nodes clustered together, I can get availability. Um, I can have things that um, will function even when one of the nodes goes out. That looks sort of like this, where I have a resource pool, and this is really what we see in the cloud, right? Where we pool our resources of CPU and RAM. Um, and then those four um, pods that I had in the previous, in this slide, those four pods can be spread across resources. Now, in that example I showed you earlier, we actually had a daemon set. So that would just be one pod. A daemon set means I'm going to run it on every node. Um, and that was the in this situation that I'm uh, simulating, every node is networked in some way. And there, so that every node needs to be able to have access to understanding information. So we use a daemon set. Um, so um, container orchestration on the edge. Let's just talk about that a little bit. Um, so some of the scenarios that, that we see, uh, it's actually very common to see single node clusters, so a single device, um, where people just want to take a, a advantage of some of the um, availability and scalability capabilities, or the, they are using um, like the container orchestration to as a, um, a step in for advisor. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a, a little further on in the presentation. Um, in addition, we've got, uh, of course, a container orchestration layer, um, and that's what the container runtime is. And then um, with K3S, uh, we have, uh, and with Edge, we have device size limitations. K3S will run well in about uh, one CPU with a gig of RAM. We often get requests to run it under a quarter of that size, about 256 megabytes of RAM. Uh, but that is not um, something that we can really do well today. I've run it in about 512 megabytes of RAM, um, but we do recommend one gig. Um, all right, so let's get on to the good stuff, network fault tolerance. So some types of network faults, I, I showed you a network fault um, that had to do with uh, low bandwidth, right? A, a, a low limit was hit, but um, in my diagrams, I was showing total loss of communication, like the, you know, the gateway just blows out, can't communicate. Um, and then if we have single nodes, um, what happens if they lose connectivity? Um, if it's a single node cluster, of course, that's it. It's out just like total loss. Um, a multi-node HA cluster with Kubernetes or container orchestration, um, if the cluster itself is HA, I might be able to move a workload over to another node. So there are some advantages there with multi-node clusters. Um, and we do see that in, in some scenarios where there, it is possible to have multiple nodes and, and sort of that HA capability uh, as well. So it varies on your, your um, use case, of course. And then of course, multi-node non-HA, we need to do something. It's, it's, it's a problem. I don't know what the problem is until you tell me more about your use case. Um, so let's look at, from here, what I want to do is look at examples, uh, specific examples uh, from customers I've talked to. Obviously, I can't share um, customer names, but um, here's an example. We've talked to a number of uh, customers and prospects that have this issue. They have these service vehicles. Uh, this is pretty common in the energy industry. Um, these vehicles, you know, think of like um, a large <laughs> truck, like a, a dump truck or garbage truck, but instead of having the garbage mechanism in the back, 
it's basically got a data center in the back. They have onboard high performance computing. They manage fleets of hundreds of these vehicles. And of course, with that, they're managing multiple um, devices on each of these computers. But the, the people on board are not IT. They're not you know, trained in networking. They're not trained in data center uh, practices. They're trained in running that and operating that truck. Um, each of these trucks, because they're mobile vehicles, they have the potential to exit the network area. Um, they often are connected only by cellular or satellite, so they already have often low bandwidth scenarios. Um, and then during a network fault, they need to continue to operate. Like if they're if they're doing some sort of drilling or or um, some sort of geo uh, detection, you know, they're mapping the Earth. Um, they they need to continue to operate in that capacity even without the connectivity um, up uplink. So um, you know they recognize they can't receive updates, they can't send data out, but they they can handle this this outage. They're aware that it's going to happen, so they take action. They stop communicating upstream locally. They when the network comes back, they flush the data. That's one example. Another example is. Um, these could be retail stores, they could be um, uh, food chains, um, you know, the conglomerates often own multiple retail stores. So this, these uh, scenarios get to a situation where they have a lot of devices. They tend to be small one to three node clusters, maybe the type of device I would actually put under my, um, under my desk, right, like a little home <laughs> device, sometimes it's a NUC, sometimes these are Raspberry Pi sized. Um, the store uses business grade or consumer grade network um, from the same providers you and I get our network home network from. Um, network outages are generally isolated to stores. Um, we do have a lot of clusters, as I was saying. So again, during a network fault, the store has to continue to operate in every capacity that it can. People still need to be able to pay. Things, of course, have changed during uh, the times of pandemic. In fact, we're seeing that these, these types of um, problems, they're increasing the amount of technology that they're putting into the stores, not decreasing it. So um, customers, they're trying to give customers the best experience possible, you know. Similar actions that they take, um, stop communicating upstream, store data locally, transmit, network comes back up. Um, and then the last one is um, in a factory. Uh, so an assembly line. Um, in this scenario, they, they often have gateways. So everything behind and downstream of the gateway doesn't even talk outside. It only talks to the gateway. Often they're less concerned about loss of connectivity between the smaller devices or the robot, necessarily smaller, and the gateway. Um, these gateways often have AI capability um, or are often highly clusters. Um, and then the edge devices will flow through the um, but the gateway has the potential to disconnect. Um, so again, during a, a network fault, their assembly lines can't go down, um, but the, the fleet management it cannot um, see the, the clusters anymore. So um, it can't even know about the downstream stuff, um, doesn't know about the gateways, but that's okay. Um, as long as you know they take the right actions. Similarly, stop trying to communicate um, continue operating the, the assembly line, flush data on return. Um, sometimes maybe what you want to do is tag the gateway as unavailable. So in Kubernetes, you can create labels and say, hey, this thing's not available. It's possible with these, sometimes this is multiple buildings on a site. Each building has its own gateway. You could connect through another gateway in another building if the networking in the, in the um, site is appropriate. So you can actually still operate, you know, have functionality uh, depending on the scenario. Um, and then often there's socket communication just between the robotics, the systems that are there not going through the gateway. So um, it can continue operating. Um, we have about five minutes left. I'm up a little bit. I would like to try and save time for questions. Um, so general considerations, right? Stop trying to store your data, flush, tag device. Um, we saw that through all those examples. Um, I kind of went through and I laid out the, the um, details on each. I'm going to do each of these uh, very quickly because you can 
walk through. If you want to stop on any of these pages, you can do that. So the next one was storing data, right? So um, we buffer and flush. Um, flush when the network comes back up. So this will vary depending on a bunch of things. Um, there are different strategies for how you might do this. And then um, tag the device. If, if it's a device that can get used, um, it, that, that you know maybe these devices are redundant in some way, maybe there's another one, something else you can use, do it. Um, network faults, uh, container orchestration can help by recognizing network faults, managing the device hardware, bringing up an alternative network, um, and uh, allowing us to do things like change default routes. Um, the K3S allows us to, container orchestration allows us to network, I can drain and cord my nodes. So that's where I can take the workloads from one, move them over to another. So if one device in, the, in a group of gateway devices lost connectivity, cord and drain it, and, and I have devices operating, and that's great, everything's running. Let's talk about K3S uh, practically, you know, the practical implications of K3S. One of the things you can do uh, is own your hardware. And in the case of network faults, that means possibly owning the network interface controller. Um, I have an example and I will share the URL with you. Um, obviously we won't have time to, to demonstrate it, but um, in, you can use one network device to bootstrap the Kubernetes system and then use a different network device to actually for communication. And, and so there are things you can do with Kubernetes to actually run uh, lower level parts of the operating system um, and devices that are connected. There are other devices possible as well. In my first attempt, when I first started doing this stuff, when I was first trying to solve some of these problems, I thought, oh, you know, I just, I want to run system control, right? So let me, let me just take over. I want to just run the supervisor the way the suit designed. Um, and what I found was that it, to do that, I had to give privileged access. I had to give like serious access to this container that was trying to control the NIC. And honestly, it was terrible, right? It's just, it's too much control. I didn't like the way I was doing it. And I realized, well, you know, what if I just take ownership from the supervisor? I mean, okay, the supervisor is useful, but actually I have this Kubernetes like control plane that can do all sorts of stuff, pretty much everything the supervisor can do. So uh, I can get scalability and reliability um, of my process, whatever that is, and I can do dependency management, which is one of the things your supervisor does. So in things like the daemon set that I showed, right, I can have something that runs everywhere and make sure it's always running. I can use Kubernetes jobs to run something once um, so I can prepare for something else that needs to run. And use init containers. I showed you a demonstration of use liveness and readiness probes to see if things are working as expected. Um, so container orchestration, um, it needs to run, it itself needs to run as a service. So the supervisor is running my K3S, my container orchestration, and that means that K3S is always on, right? So if that goes down, the supervisor will make sure my Kubernetes is running, and then I can use my Kubernetes to do things like manage my devices for network interface management. The container orchestration, of course, so I said it runs as a set supervisor, yep. Oh, the capabilities. I can access all sorts of stuff in Linux using uh, Kubernetes capabilities, the process ID, um, the, the host network, um, get to the host processes. There are a ton more. Do man capabilities in Linux or uh, look at Kubernetes capabilities to find more out about that. And um, with that, I'm gonna share my related projects. The first project is the one we didn't demo today, the turnkey project, an example of owning the network interface. And the second one is um, to watch for throttle bandwidth in that example we did see today. Um, what's next? Up to you. Um, define a controller. We could do the, all of this through a control uh, one-off daemon set type thing um, and take a look at Linux capabilities. Thanks for joining me today and I think my time is up and um, I'll hope to uh, present to you again sometime soon. Hi, um, 
uh, there's just uh, there's just one question. Um, great. So um, there there is one question in the Q and A. Um, if you have any others, um, go ahead and put them in, and we'll probably have to switch over to Slack. Um, the the question came up um, is Fleet some offering from Rancher? Um, Fleet both refers to sort of a fleet of devices. Um, First time I heard the fleet term was probably 20 years ago in terms of a fleet of trucks, um, where you know uh, using credit cards they 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 would manage the the fleet of trucks that could go to the gas station and what what they could access from the credit card. In this case, it's a fleet of devices. It could be a fleet of the the devices may be a part of a cluster. So there may be a, a single device may be a cluster in in its own right, but that device may also be a part of a larger cluster. Uh, it can't be both. It, it either has to be its own cluster or part of a larger cluster. And then there is a project from Rancher which will be released uh, in early October, which um, it, and actually the project is out in open source on GitHub now, um, and that is a um, fleet manager. So it's manage, managing um, multiple clusters, um, and it's designed to manage tens of thousands of clusters. Um, in a GitOps manner. And uh, I will be doing some demos on that in other talks at other sessions, um, not at Linux Foundation this year, but um, in upcoming uh, summits. Um, so um, to keep the conversation going, um, please visit the number two cloud native networking on our Slack workspace uh, after the session ends. Thank you.